There is a growing movement today that all church leadership has been imposed on true Christianity from the outside. Usually it's said by the Emperor Constantine, and that we need to return back to the true roots of Christianity, the early church, which is talked about in reverent tones and described as a glorious leaderless time when Christians met in house churches with no oversight, sharing equally and fully with others. But is that really what it was like? What leadership was there in the early church, and on what authority was it based? Because every leadership has some authority backing it, even if it's just that person's personality. To answer those questions, we need to start with the disciples right when Jesus left. There was no written text yet, no New Testament, no set theology, just a few people in a room trying to figure out what Jesus meant for them. The only authorities they knew were Jesus and the Jewish law. So those most knowledgeable about the law and closest to Jesus slowly became leaders, mostly the disciples. But it was still a group effort, with much of what today would be considered pastoral duties given to other people. But outside Jerusalem, it was far more chaotic because most places did not have a disciple to lead them. Evangelists would go from town to town teaching, get a small group of believers together, and then leave, encouraging the people to lead themselves. Sometimes elders would be appointed as leaders, but this usually appears to have literally been simply the oldest, most mature people there. This was nothing like the modern pastor, as the only verse in the Bible that mentions pastor, literally shepherd, in a church leadership setting, listed alongside prophets, evangelists, apostles, and teachers, all of which were separate functions, but all of which have been rolled into the single modern role of pastor. But this scattered and informal way of dealing with church was woefully inadequate when it came to deciding the big issues, like what it meant to be a Christian. Some believers, like James, were content to accept the Jewish law as authoritative as well, living as a Jewish sect. But others, like Paul, felt that this was a new thing and that the old food laws of Jewish life did not matter. The faction sparred in local churches where no one had authority to answer it, and finally, the issue was sent to the apostles in Jerusalem because it was destroying the churches. There, the congregation, led by a group who had known Jesus best, established not only that the Old Testament purity laws were not authoritative to Christians, but also that they being the closest people to Jesus, were also the final authority on decisions about the faith. Jewish tradition was removed as an authority, and proximity of an individual to Jesus was cemented. The disciples were head of the church. And this worked okay, while the disciples were alive. But as churches grew all over the place and disciples started dying off, then the churches were left with no authority at all over them. And rather than being a utopia, it went to pot. I mean, Christianity was already stretching across vast language differences between the Latin West, the Greek Mediterranean, Aramaic or Syriac in the Middle East, and Persian further east. Not to mention cultural and political bridges that had to be crossed as Christianity expanded beyond the borders of the Roman Empire and into Kush, Parthia, and the Gothic tribes. No one could decide on things like whether Jesus was God or what the Bible looked like, what salvation meant, or almost anything else. Bizarre, illogical, or flat wrong ideas began to spread, like that Jesus didn't actually come in the flesh, but only as a spirit pretending to be human. And this couldn't count as heresy because there was no leadership in place, no authority to decide what orthodoxy was. Christianity needed somewhere to turn to to get questions answered, some authority to rely upon, but different areas of the church came up with different solutions. One group called Montanists, after their leader, wanted to place all ultimate authority in God, and so relied upon the Holy Spirit to inspire leaders to make every decision. So prophets became central to this branch of Christianity, and new revelations were common as their prophets made decisions about a new situation that was confronting the church. But one city's prophets could contradict another, and it could easily be exploited. It was a great theory, but impractical, and soon began disagreeing with what Jesus was known to have commanded. Another group recognized that Christians did not agree on what were the important writings, and so were operating with very different levels of knowledge from one church to another. 
But this group took that liability and made it their authority. Called the Gnostics, they focused on the idea that there were secret writings revealed only to a few. And certainly, the lesser shared letters would still have seemed like that to many people of that age. Often, however, this supposedly secret knowledge went directly against what was commonly known about Jesus, denying his humanity and even his actual death on the cross. Additionally, an authority that required continued secrecy cannot easily be shared or verified by the masses. So, while Gnosticism was wildly popular in some circles, it eventually died out. During this time, Christianity also began to be attacked by leading Roman philosophers of the day for what they saw as Christianity's illogical beliefs. And a third group of Christians, primarily from larger, more educated areas, began to rework Christianity so that it held water when compared to the best of Greek thinking. These apologists, meaning defenders, organized and synthesized Christian thought with Greek and Roman philosophy in order to give it a logical authority, where each belief logically flowed from the previous one. Justin Martyr is the most famous and earliest member of this school, though some aspects of it can be seen also in the Bible, where Jesus is described as the Logos, the Word made flesh in John 1, which is a philosophical term. When Aristotle was rediscovered in Europe during the Middle Ages, scholars were shocked with how well his thinking fit the Christianity that they knew. Well, yes, because the Christianity being practiced in Western Europe was shaped to fit with Aristotle. Finally, there were people who tried to maintain the line of the apostles, that their thought process was that if the disciples got their authority from being close to Jesus, then surely other leaders could get their authority from being close to the disciples. So many of the earliest Christian leaders, like Clement or Polycarp, staked their claim on the fact that they were in turn the disciple of one of the original twelve. In an era when the stories of Jesus were still primarily verbally being passed on, being able to say, I heard it from so-and-so, or, well, I was taught by, gave authority to someone. And it certainly helped that people who had this apostolic authority, authority from the apostles, generally tended to say pretty similar things. So slowly, this vision of authority, reinforced by Greek philosophy, won the day. This led to some churches slowly gaining status over other ones because of their association with a particular apostle. Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria, and Rome in particular. Smaller churches in the area would automatically turn to a larger, better informed church nearby who had more writings and seek their opinions. They would also send people to the bigger churches to learn, which slowly became a stamp of authority, and the ordination process as we know it was born. Leadership began to be formalized, but this was not unilateral control over a church by an individual. Even the best and the brightest worked within a group setting, and leadership was far more fluid and far more spread out than today. In order to preach or give communion, you might have to be from that line of apostles and have a recognized pedigree, but that doesn't mean that you had sole leadership of the church. This fluidity, however, ended with the Emperor Constantine. He brought Christianity out of the shadows, and one of the first things that he noticed was the immense divide among all these different beliefs of different Christians. Soon, Constantine ordered that leaders from all over the empire come and finally settle some of these differences. It was a great theory, but in reality, this merely sheared off large portions of Christianity, as basically all versions of it from outside the empire could not come and so were deemed heretics and dismissed. More on that in a future video. It was Constantine who created official religious positions and gave political power to back religious authority. Now, this successfully joined the power of the church to the power of the state in ways that haven't fully been broken in our minds today. And it solidified a priestly position as the head of the local church, someone certified by the larger church as having a clue what's going on. This was necessary because with the sudden rise of Christianity's popularity, that meant that most people knew little more than its name. 
Leaders needed to be certified so that this newly defined orthodox thinking could be passed on. And the more specifically the theology got worked out, the more training was needed to know what to say and do. This is coupled how in the West, over time, the languages kept shifting until only a few people could read the Bible, let alone understand it. And the priest became the sole source of authority on religious matters. No one else could check the Bible or knew the history. And sadly, for the most part, this continued with the Reformation. New ideas required even more explaining and the pastor took on even more authority until today the pastor is often the sole leader in a church sent by a larger denomination to be the authority figure. Which is a far cry from the early church for sure. Modern critiques of the pastor have a great deal of validity. But the early church was no idyllic picnic of leaderless house churches either. They were mired in chaos without a clear authority anywhere in sight, and it almost ruined the church. Early believers did not reject unity or authority. They sought it out, and they kept trying to find ways that could adapt to changing situations without abandoning truth. The early church shows that when new problems arise, some amount of leadership and authority is helpful, both locally and on a larger scale. However, in no way does leadership have to look like the modern do-it-all, know-it-all pastor, a role that doesn't appear for centuries, and a role that, yes, Constantine can take some of the blame in solidifying. But he cannot take the blame for creating leadership. That was something the early church was seeking for centuries. Next week will be a much shorter look at how we got the Pope and how this supposedly spiritual man got so much earthly power at times. I hope you'll stick around for it. But until then, thank you for watching. Have a great week. See you next Friday.